Okay. There are days when I feel the best of me is ready to begin. And there are days when I feel I'm letting go. I'm soaring on the wind. Cause I've learned in laughter or in pain how to survive. I get on my knees. I get on my knees. There I am before the love that changes me. See, I don't know how, but they spur when I'm on my knees. I can be in a crowd all by myself and almost anywhere when I feel there's a need to talk with God. He's Emmanuel. When I close my eyes, no darkness there. There's only light. I get on my knees. I get on my knees. There I am before the love that changes me. See, I don't know how, but they spur in the blue sky, in the midnight, when I'm on my knees, I get on my knees, there I am before the love that changes me, see, I don't know how, but they spur when I'm on my, oh, when I'm on my, when I'm on my knees. Our God and Father, we just thank you again for an opportunity to be your people before you and to hear from you through your word. We ask that you would speak to our hearts, challenge us, change us, use us so that you are not only satisfied with the outcome, Lord, but we are prepared to be further honed and fine-tuned for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you all know the text, and uh, it was Psalm 100. No, I'm not going to preach from Psalm 100, but we're going to refer back to it. I, I think one of the things that we're going to begin to see we're going to camp out if you're wondering what scripture I'm going to actually go from. And that's Luke chapter 17. And we're going to take a look at 10 lepers. And I'd like to consider one the grateful leper. I don't know how your Bibles, you know, all Bibles have a heading over a bunch, <laughs> bunch of verses. But I'm going to consider this to be the, the grateful leper. And eventually you'll see where we're going to go back to your, your sheet, if you want to take notes, um, where we have Psalm 100 written down. Because the same thing that occurred there is what God wanted when we get to Luke, and it's also what he wants when he gets to the 21st century where you and I are. Now I'm going to read from Luke chapter 17, 11, verses 11 through 19. That's all. And then we're going to unpack it a little bit and begin to see how a God-fearer, so to speak, a Gentile, probably has a better handle on Old Testament scriptures than those who are brought up hearing it over and over and over again and reciting it. It's a lesson to all of us. It speaks to me. How close do you have to be to God's word before it penetrates and, and, and changes you? And that's what we're going to look at. Are we there? Luke chapter 17, verse 11. This is not the King James. This is the New English translation. So anyway, verse 11. Now on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. As he was entering a village, ten men with leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. 
raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, or Rabbi, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went along, they were cleansed. Verse 15. Then one of them, when he saw he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell to his face on the ground at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Now, there's a parenthesis in all your Bibles. The writer's letting us know now that he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus said, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to turn back to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to the man, get up, go your way. Your faith has made you well, or some translations has saved you, depending. So we just had a blessing to the Lord, had a blessing to the reading of his word. Now, this text has a lot in it, and uh, I'm going to respect the out. You know, I'm going to respect the time, and we're not going to. I was just looking at it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> at any rate, though, uh, notice what's happening here. Jesus is en route from Judea to Galilee. Now, you have to understand prejudice back then is no different than it is today. The Samaritans were half-breeds. In other words, through no accident of their own, through, I guess, the accident of birth, some were born into mixed families. That means one parent was Jewish, the other parent was Gentile. And so they were sort of allowed to live in this area, not with the pure Gentiles and not with the pure Jews. Look familiar? Sound familiar? <laughs> Look at the spectrum of America. Certain groups of people are sort of just congregating in certain areas. Well, Jesus was en route. And most Jews in those days chose not to go to, through Samaria. It's like going through the hood. It's a little risky if it was dark. There were a lot of crags and, and hills and, and rocks. And so people who couldn't find employment would sort of take advantage of those who were coming by and looked like they were dressed better than they were. Similar to Philly in New York. You know, certain neighborhoods you don't dare go to certain times of the day because you may be the prey or the victim. And so this was the kind of situation that Jesus found himself on. He was en route. And the interesting thing is, as he's there, you see ten men who have something in common. Now, as you read in the text, you notice one is a Samaritan and, and Jesus refers to him as a foreigner. So you realize they weren't all Jewish. But as he goes there, what is it they say? At a distance, they shout out to Jesus, stand back, because they were Jewish. And you know how you know that? That was the behavior that the Old Testament said you do if you have leprosy back in Leviticus. You warn those that are approaching so that they do not catch this incurable disease. All right? Just think about how we are. We have lots of incurable diseases. We name them. Some we brand as transgender. Some we brand as addicts. Some we brand as we blame the way they were brought up. But the scenario there and here was no different. They had a problem like we have a problem. So Jesus sees these 10 men, has compassion on them, and what does he do? He tells them to go show themselves to the priests, which is another Old Testament commandment. You show yourself to the priests, and then the priest will declare you leprosy free. You're, he examines your skin, and you don't have that disease. Now, these men do that, which means that they all had a certain degree of what we would call faith to follow the command of Jesus to even do that. And in route, one checks himself out, says, hey, I'm healed. So what does he do? He runs back to Jesus, falls at his feet, singing, praising, shouting. He's ecstatic. He's exuberant. He's out of his skull, so to speak. He's lost his mind. He's so happy with what God has done for him. 
And Jesus tells him what? He, he makes note of it. The writer, Luke, makes note of it. This man was a Samaritan. Wasn't a Jew, but a Samaritan. Now, the context of the whole chapter, Jesus is talking to Jewish people. He's talking to the Pharisees at the beginning of the book. And what he's trying to help them realize is that you don't have it all together. You, you think you're special because you are descendants of Abraham. Truth be known, we are all descendants of Abraham, especially believers, but that's another lesson. But the idea here is this, that these men received grace from God. And that's what's amazing about God's grace. He's no respecter of person. He sees the plight and the need, and he offers grace. These were 10 men who had a life-threatening terminal illness. They pleaded to him for help. Jesus having a heart of compassion. Here's their cry. Here's their plea. And what does he do? He acts. He goes into response. That's what the grace of God does. God looked down from heaven. He sees our plight. He sees the gap between being created in his image and where we are, a total disgrace to his image. Because believe me, the way men live, talk, and carry on today can't be, cannot be what God planned to have it happen. He would have not made us vice agents to control and have the domain of the planet Earth and everything on it to carry on the way we do today. You look at any scenario you want across the globe, you can even stay here in Lansdale, spread it out to Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, the United States, the Northeast Corridor, whatever section of humanity you pick, it's a total mess. Because that's not the way God wanted it. And God is the only one who can fix it. And so this Gentile, this Samaritan, realized that. And what does he do? He falls at the mercy of the one who saved him, the one who touched him, the one who changed his condition, and he worships him. And that's what the psalmist is saying back in Psalm 100. Did you notice that? Serve the Lord is what it says. Well, the real meaning of that is worship. Because the way God sees it, all that you do is for him. Somewhere along the line in God's equation, we're not that important. You know, I know you look in the mirror, you think, oh, man, look at this wonderful hunk of human being. You know, and you're fascinated with your hair. My wife couldn't wait to the point where it all got gray. Silver, I'm sorry. Because when it was half of where, a little bit there, it, 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 didn't, it didn't match her what she wanted to see, so she would have it dyed. But she was so happy. You should have been home. She was so happy when the roots started coming out gray or silver because that meant she didn't have to get these crazy dyes and she could just let it flourish. And, you know, we, we all have that, you know? Uh, I, 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 there's some people, you know, you, you know how old they are, and, and you see this dark hairline because we don't want to let go of youth. They sell it on television. They sell it in magazines. You can have what you always were then. But that's not God's plan. You see, God wants us to grow in what? Grace. God wants us to become more like his. So that's why life is what? Miserable sometimes. How many of you can say that 2017 was not what you thought it would be at the end of 2016? Amen. There were more surprises, more disappointments, more Judases came into your life. I'm going to mention that. You know, Judas was one of the 12. Think about Jesus. And we're going to get back to these, these 10 men in a minute. Think about him. He picks, handpicks these 12 individuals to mentor, to go with him. They're walking in the dust of the rabbi. They're becoming more like him. They're seeing him heal. They're, see, they're hearing his words. They're there just as awestruck as everybody else, listening to the parables that answer the questions that these, these great minds are asking him. 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Somebody stops you in the corner and passes saying, what are you going to say? You know? Or, or would you think of a lost coin as a response? Or would you think of a son who didn't like home and asked his dad for the inheritance, which wasn't due, and he runs off with it and loses it all? Well, you can go through the scriptures of all the parables. You know, the parable about the soil, the seeds, and, and all of these, would you be able to come up with one of those for an answer to the question? You'd be scratching your head. I've got to get back to you. Let me talk to Pastor Sam. Let me talk to Pastor Hart. I, I, give me a phone number. I will call you with an answer. But Jesus was able to do that. And so he worked with these 12 men closely. They knew him. They saw him pray. They saw him teach. They saw him heal. They saw him do all these miracles. And then with this close bond, one is going to sell him out. Not for a big sum. 30 pieces of silver. You know how much that was worth then? The price of a slave. Someone is going to perhaps clean the house. Cut your lawn in today's vernacular. Shovel the snow, remove the snow. And that's what he was willing to sell Jesus for. No huge sum. And you can imagine the heart of Jesus. Here's someone you spend your life with, time with, working with, 24-7, seeing them grow, seeing them develop, mentoring them, helping them understand how to relate to people, how to do these things. And he turns his back on you. And what does Jesus do? What you have to do, go do it. He didn't pitch a fit. How many of us, knowing that someone close to us would do that, would be so genteel? You wouldn't. That's not us. And that's why God says, if you're going to be like my son, you've got to come to me and allow me to be in you with my power of my spirit to change you. Because the way you are, you're not going to mimic Jesus by any stretch of your imagination. You're not going to look like a Christ follower should look. And now that's the same context that we're looking at here when we look at Luke the grateful leper. You see, for grace to be functioning, for us to really appreciate grace, we have to receive it without any thought of repayment. How many of you get a Christmas card from someone you forgot about, and what's the first thing you do? What's the first thing you do? You get a card and mail it back. Right? Why? Because... You think you owe. Many times that's the way we look at the grace of God. Do you know that? We work ourselves into a frenzy because of what God has done for us on, on the cross. Some of the hymns support that thinking. That's not scripture. Grace isn't grace if you can pay for it. It's, it's a business transaction. Think that one through. You know, sometimes Christians say, I've, I've got to do this for God. I'm doing this for God because Jesus died for me. I'm doing this for God. Where is that between Genesis and Revelation? The grace of God is a free gift. God supplied it. God gives it. God changed the account so that you could be reconciled to him. All right? You don't owe God anything. You see, it was an equal transaction with God. He could now look at you, address you, work with you, because why? He's traded your old nature for the new, and that's, in God's eyes, value for value. Christ's blood paid for your sin debt. That's the way God sees it. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to do this for God. God isn't asking you to do that for him. He wants your motivation of service and work to be based on what? What's the word I'm looking for? F-A-I-T-H. What's the word I'm looking for? Hey, you doubt me? Go home. This is a homework assignment. You're going to get two assignments. Look 
this afternoon at the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and see the motivation of works in that chapter by all those people. It is faith is the motivator. I believe in God so much that if he did this for me in the past, I just know what tomorrow's going to look like. We were singing that this morning, when we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a drag it'll be. I didn't hear that phrase in the hymn. When we all get to heaven, we'll what? Sing and shout the victory, rejoicing. What do you think this leper was doing? He was excited. And the text points out that he was not a Jew. It said subtly twice. He was a foreigner, an alien. And then the other part says he was a Samaritan. You see, God isn't playing favorites because of how you were born. He's not playing favorites because you've been churched all your life. He's not playing favorites because your mother or grandparents prayed for you. No. You've got to come out of the closet on your own and accept that gift of grace. And when you accept it, you should be ecstatic because you don't deserve it. You can't possibly pay him back for it, but he wants you to walk in it. And that's the challenge most of us have as believers, walking in the promises that God gave us. Why? Because it gets ugly. It gets dirty. How many times you try to do what God has called you to do and you get smacked in the face? You're excited about spreading the gospel and say, hey, we can't have that talk around here in the workplace. But this is my lunch break. We still don't want it here. You know, or you're in college or in school and you say, well, the Bible says this. I don't believe that. And the professor says, well, you can believe what you want, but all the stacks of science say this. You talk about global warming. You know, that's something that's out of our pur purview if, if you didn't know it. Just like the weather. How many of you can call the shots and how cold it's going to get tonight? No, seriously. There are certain things that are in God's domain. He allows us to thrive and have some impact on it, but we can't control global warming if it is such a thing. We can't control global freezing. The God didn't give us that. He's concerned with what we do with the grace that he's given us through Jesus Christ. He's, he's created the only way. You notice how narrow the gospel is? One way. You tell somebody there's one way, they'll laugh at you. Most math problems can be solved more than one way. Most answers to questions can be created or given more than one way. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the good news from God, there's one way. So someone will say it's very narrow. It's very exclusive. Indeed it is. But by the same token, it's the only message out there that's all-inclusive. And this text brings that out. Ten men dying. They're all healed. No respective persons the same way. What happens? One comes back praising, thanking. You notice the text says he got down on his knees before Jesus. The others didn't even write him a thank you note. This man comes back, falls at his feet, thanking him. That's what the psalmist was talking about when you read Psalm 100. Kick your heels and say, yes. As Christians, we're too, you know, we're so conservative. We don't want to, you know. I, I, that can't be your Eurocentric heritage. Because you've been in America long enough that you don't even like the music from the old masters over there. Most people don't listen to classical music anymore. You know, I say Ludwig, you say who? Beethoven. Now, there's certain ones that we enjoy, certain ones we hear often enough, but we really don't do that because we've disassociated ourselves with the old world. You know, that's how we call Europe the old world. This is the new world. This is different. This is new. We're avant-garde. We're there. We got it together. Do we? We're just like those 10. Whether you're from there or from here, you have an incurable disease. There's only one doctor, one cure. 
That cure was given 2,000 years ago. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. People don't realize how serious that is. That's the only way God wants to look at you. Otherwise, you're on your own. And I don't care what university you go to, how many degrees you have beyond 98, you cannot do it on your own. You see, that's the problem. We like to take our pride and say, well, look what I've done. I can do this. I've accomplished that. I'm this, I'm that. You know, we have all kinds of things on our shelves at home, memories. We're good. But realize, each and every victory you get and conquer, who provided the avenue for that? And so, so often we forget. You know, we're going into Thanksgiving. And, and I think sometimes we forget. And that's why, I don't know, Brother Irv, can, can we put that up? That's the song of Thanksgiving. Good. I, I share this because her name is Ruth. She's a cousin of mine. Married into the family. She is a person who has had nothing but heartache, pain, disappointment. But to talk to her, you'd never know it. Because she has a relationship with God that is admirable. Now, this is one of the many things that she, you know what she's done? She's taken all of her pain and penned it. She's taken all of those moments and put it to writing. The frustrations with all of the eight children they've raised. Uh, the, the, the recent situation in Houston, in which their house took a big hit. Um, all of this she adds. Now, many of her things are published. This, this is published now. It's a song. There are many groups that sing it. Uh, you can go on YouTube and hear it. She's published three books of poetry. Uh, I think she's going to get a fellowship um, to one of the great universities in terms of their writing program. But I'm saying that to let you know that she is a normal, everyday person who has taken the frustrations of life and put them on the Lord and allows, just like the psalmist, to vent. Just like that grateful leper to vent. You know, Scripture doesn't tell you about the other ten, so we're not going to speculate on them. Whether they had an epiphany, whether they came to the Lord, whether they came to it, we don't know. Jesus is trying to show his audience in this text that you don't have to be Jewish. You don't have to be raised by a rabbi. You don't have to live in the synagogue to do what God wants you to do. And I think sometimes we forget that. No, yes, it's good to be in church. It's good to be around God's people. It's good to be in front of the Word. It's good to hear the Word. God has designed it that way. But that does not give you, what I should say, victory. It's that relationship. Now, notice what it says here. Um, did, you, did you read the top part of this, why she wrote it? I, I think that's, that's, that's very instructive. Um, I have a copy here so I can read along with you. All right? It's a song of thanksgiving. And I was thinking about that because we're in thanksgiving. And I think the amazing thing about grace is that we're not as thankful for it as we should be. Grace is absolutely amazing. I mean, there's, there's grace that we, we have all of these things that we, we enjoy in life. God uses sinners and evil people to create museums. You, you, you look, at the, look at many of the hospitals where the money has been funded and donated to build these great institutions of healing and helping the sick. The founders of many of these things have no regard for God. But God allows them and their dream to benefit those who love him. And you see how amazing grace is. It just creates a weave right through all the mess of humanity. It starts from Calvary and flows out to us. But that's God's plan. Now, here, life can hit you with the unexpected and the normal uh, and natural thing. The natural thing to do is what? To expect, I'll, I'll read it from here to expect those who claim to care to have your back. When they don't, you pray, but nothing changes. You learn and press on. A Judas experience. Okay? It goes on, the first part, it says, it doesn't matter what I'm going through, I'll always sing to you. I'll lift my voice in praise. 
you've honored me in many ways. Once my faith was falling down, I couldn't count on those around. I got on my knees and prayed. You helped me get through those days. This is the chorus part here. You are a God of second chances. You've caused me to see. You gave me beauty from ashes. Thank you for loving me. Just pause right there. Can you picture that Samaritan leper singing that? Can you see where it fits? The psalmist who wrote Psalm 100. You notice at the head of that psalm, it doesn't say a psalm of David. That's intentionally left unknown. Now, the psalm before it and the one after says Psalm of David, but that one, for some odd reason, doesn't say that. Interesting. I think sometimes God wants us to be able to identify with an anonymous individual. And those of you who don't know, a little, little history for you. Amazing Grace, which is the title of the message, you probably thought you'd hear the song, but you didn't. Amazing Grace can be played on all the black keys on the piano. It's an outgrowth of living underneath in the shave slips from Ghana over here, those who survived. And many would sing to that tune, not necessarily the words Amazing Grace, but there would be a hum as they were in rhythm rowing across the Atlantic, which is not a very calm ocean. All right? The owner of the slave ship, John Newton, had an epiphany where he accepted Christ and realized the wretched life that he lived. And while hearing this on the boat, you know, you hear this mm, humming, humming, humming constantly. He put his thoughts to words, and that's the origin or foundation of the hymn Amazing Grace. So a lot of times you have to go through turmoil before you really appreciate the power of grace and the power of God in your life. Let's go on, all right? You've taken me, you've taken away my guilt and shame. There's Paul right there, Romans chapter 1, 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It removes shame. That's one thing the gospel does. I don't care what your past is. If it's ugly, worse than ugly, quadruple ugly, God removes those stains because he accepts you and changes you. The closer you get to him, you can't be in the presence of God and not come out anything like his son. So, you've removed the dirt from my name. You know, we have reputations and, man, they can get sullied, sometimes deservingly, sometimes not. You filled me when I was dry. You gave me wings to fly. I've gone through many trials and I've grown. Underline that. I'm going to see if you can get a copy of this. I didn't do that on my own. You see, see the realization here? I've gone through many trials and I got through them, but I didn't do it alone. You were leading me on. My, sad, my sadness and my fears are gone. You see... Gratitude is not to pay back God. Gratitude is to echo the grace that God has extended to you. Do you get that? Gratitude is a mirror. And so often we feel like with that Christmas card, let me, I think I got another stamp. You, you know, you, you want to pay him back. You, oh, they invited me for dinner. Yeah, fine. Let's look at the calendar. When can you come to my house? Yeah, I'll go to lunch with you. Then you're thinking, hmm. What's good in your calendar? I want to take you to lunch. You follow what I'm saying? We, we live a life in a, in a world where it's tit for tat. You do that for me? Well, phew, I've got to do that for you. And so we take that mindset and we bring it to God. And God is saying, you can't do a thing that I need. You know, the only thing you're indebted to is justice, not grace. You know, uh, when you read um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, forgive us our debts as what? That's, that's the kind of debt you're forgiven. But you don't owe God anything. When you say grace, it's all from God. Ephesians 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved. Now what are you going to pay God back for that? You can't. He touches your heart. No one comes to the Father except by me, is what Jesus says. 
And so where do we get this mindset that this is a business transaction? God saved me, so I'm indebted to him. Like I said, you have to be careful some of the hymns you read, old and new, because some of the words in there will get you to think that, you know, uh, there's one I think of, um, What Hast Thou Done For Me? But I think it's uh, Francis Havergal. You're not going to find that in Scripture. You, you know, you, you, you feel, you, by the time you finish that hymn, you feel, oh my goodness, let me go home and, and straighten this out with God. I owe him so much. I owe my time, my life. And the, it's not you owe God anything. It's your faith and confidence in God that motivates you to serve. That's why I said your homework assignment between now and Thanksgiving is to read one time in a readable translation, Hebrews chapter 11. And look at all of the events that occur in there and what's the motivator. It's not paying God back. You can't pay God back. You know, how many of you ever had a newborn child in the house? What would your response be if at age one on their first birthday, they said, I'm going to pay you back that? <laughs> You'd laugh. How can you possibly pay me back? You can't even walk, and you're going to pay me back. Well, that's the same ridiculousness that God is looking at. You're going to pay God back. He created everything, provided your salvation, gave you the grace to be able to see and accept and respond to it. He gives you the grace to sustain you through it, which is sanctification. And we're going to pay him back. It's not only foolish, it's insulting. You know, because I brought you lunch, you have to take me out to dinner? I did it because I like you, and I could afford it too. But, but what I'm saying is, we don't live with God the way we live with one another. Payback. Everything is payback. Why? We have to have a clean slate. I don't owe you anything. You don't owe me anything so we can be friends? Where's the love in that? Don't get married with that mindset, young people. Marriage is a relationship. It's not a contract, well, you fix eggs for me this morning, I'm going to scramble yours tomorrow. No, 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 no. I fix these because I love you. That's why we're married. I mean, but, you know, if you go into any lasting relationship on an IOU basis, it's disaster. And don't do it with God because it's disaster. And, you know, a lot of people are living in a false hope. They're not living on the anchor of faith because what God did at Calvary, I'm good to go because why? He's got my back. It's, oh, God did that at Calvary. Then I got to go to church on Sunday. I got to tithe. I sure can't watch that program on TV. I can't say those words when I'm angry. You know, we have a whole list of what I can't do because I don't want to step out of the safety zone because I'm so indebted to God for what he did on Calvary. That's not what Scripture teaches. Don't live your life that way. It's a misery. God loves you unconditionally. Do you realize that God is the only individual in the universe who will accept you smelly, stinky, ugly, whatever, okay? He'll accept you as you are on one condition, that you allow him to take care of your debt. Now, if you're so high and mighty, you're going to pay it yourself, God is going to let you try. There's nobody that can remove your sin problem except Jesus. But a lot of people say, ah, no, nope, I'm good. My works will get me there. And for you young people, that's the big difference between your faith in Jesus Christ and all the other religions your peers on the team in school may have. They're working their way to get what you've got. And you can't work long enough, hard enough, well enough to do it. And God knows that. So he says, hey, I'm going to help you out. Take the grace I'm giving you. I'm giving you the desire, the motivation, the understand, and the transformation all through Christ. So when I look at your record, I see Jesus' blood there, you're good to go. If I don't see Jesus' blood there, no excuse. But, 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 
No excuse. And you know, Scripture is very d direct about that. Romans says, every mouth shall be stopped. You can't even cough an excuse. God says, there's nothing you can say. I've done it all. I've urged your heart to accept it. You wanted to do it your way. We're going to let you do it your way. You know, God's an awesome parent. You know, we put out so many safety and boundaries so our kids don't bruise a knee. God says, listen, and if with all the evidence I put out there about my existence, my love for you, my miracles with these 10 men is one small example. How many of you have ever had a physical miracle, a medical miracle? Come on. If you've had a surgery and you're walking today, it's a miracle. Not everybody gets off the table. You ever know that? A lot of people, huh, well, it was their time. The grace of God gets you through all of these issues. You ever have a close call on the highway? And you can't imagine that you walked out of the car when you look back at it. You know, my son a couple of years ago had, I mean, by all accounts, the way his car was wrapped around the pole, somebody pushed him into it. He shouldn't be walking. Even the police were dumbfounded. They, you look at the car, you don't expect somebody to be, it was around the corner from where we live, at my house on the phone, calling the insurance company. You figure the ambulance would have taken him away. And we would have had a funeral and the whole process for him. It's the grace of God. You can't explain these things. But what you need to do is to fall on your face and your knees and praise and worship and thank him. And that's what God wants us to do. Now, do I have time? Yes, you've got one homework assignment. Based upon this poem that you saw, I'd like you all to look at Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to close there. This is only for those who have a relationship with God. No, because you wouldn't appreciate it if you don't. If you're borderline, you won't. Romans chapter 5, for the context, read the first 11 verses. But in light of this poem, read up to verse 2, 3, and 4. And the reason I'm asking you to do that is this. Somewhere along the line, we believe that the Christian life is wine and roses, milk and honey, peaches and pie. But you see here the attitude that it's talking about. Some translations use the word boast. The better translation is rejoice in your sufferings. And it goes on to say that works patience. And that works character. You see, once we're saved, God's going to allow us to get hit by all kinds of windy storms. Because God knows that that tests our faith. The harder the wind, the rougher the storm, the more you cling to him. That's where your faith develops its muscle strength. Not all this hoopla and say, yeah, yeah, I'm saved, I got it. No. God's going to put you through some stuff. He's going to take you through some stuff. And while he does it, he wants you not to forget to rejoice, as we saw in that poem. Not to forget to rejoice, as we read in, in Psalm 100. That's what God wants. He doesn't care what you're going through. Okay, you lost your house. Fine. You lost your fortune. Fine. Yeah, you're sick like Job. Fine. Where am I in your life is what God is asking. How important am I is what God... That's the question we have to answer. You know? Do we love comfort, ease, self more than God or not? And it's only trials. So, you know, that's the acid test. You can tell me what you want. You can tell Pastor Sam, Pastor Tony, Pastor Tyrus what you want. But it's that acid test is what God is looking for from true believers. And that's the acid test God is looking for. You know, you can raise your hand and say, I believe, I believe, I believe. But if you're converted, notice, last thing I'm going to point out. Notice what it says in verse 15 and 18 in the reference we read about the lepers. They came back or they didn't come back. There's a, there's a deeper message there than just coming back to say thank you. Coming back is our posture before God. That's the real blood and guts of the meaning of repentance. Coming back. You see, if you read Lamentations 5 and 21, it says, call us and we'll come back, is what, what the Hebrew people are saying. God wants us to be in our original state before him. It requires coming back. And the only way you can repent and come back is to love 
him more than the sin. Do you love the sin more? You want to stay in that playground? Or do you love God? Or are you going to venture with him? And that's what it's about. And so Jesus is pointing these things out to his audience when he says that. This leper came back, but where are the other nine? He had a change of heart. He realized who God was. That's the only thing that's going to make him bow down and worship and jump and shout for joy. He's had an internal awakening as to who it was who removed his leprosy. Roll the cameras back now. It's you and I who need to have that kind of awakening as to where we are spiritually. The leper's a good view of yourself in the mirror, good view of me in the mirror. Do I love what Jesus did for me and who he is more than the mess he took me from? Because the mess he's taking you from is tempting. You wouldn't be in the mess if it wasn't. You know, you wouldn't be hooked on what you're hooked on if it wasn't so great or enjoyable. And that's the choice you need to make. So let's, let's talk to our Heavenly Father. Our Holy Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for just teaching us, Lord, that gratitude is not a payment back. It's not a mortgage payment. It's just the mere echo of your grace and goodness to us. Father, as your people, we realize not only what you've done, Lord, but we realize the love that's generated in our hearts because of what you've done. And that love, Lord, compels us to choose you over other things. That love, Father, compels us to rejoice in your presence. Not in our circumstances, but to rejoice in your presence. Father, give us the courage to live by your spirit and not by our gut. Give us the courage to think on your word, to meditate on your word, and to appreciate your word. Father, we, we have a mixed audience always, Lord, and we just ask that your spirit would speak to those here today, Lord, whether it's recommitment, whether it's a new commitment. Help us all to leave here, Lord, to realize that a relationship with you is what you desire. You put us on this earth, Lord, so that we could have a relationship with you. You sent Christ to cover our debt of sin so that we could have a relationship with you. You want us to serve you through faith and reliance on the power and strength of your spirit so that we can enhance or enjoy an enhancement of that relationship with you. Lord, if nothing else today, just allow your people to realize that it's all about you and not about us. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name.